Sir, last Sir, was Joseph Keyport. Thanks, uh, Steve. Station. I know yep. last night we had some issues, but uh, today, since I've been on, it's been fine. And it is 10 o'clock here, so we will start the meeting by saying uh, the meeting will be held in person and via WebEx video phone conference. No more than two county commissioners will be present in the meeting room. The public may join the meeting via WebEx or in person at the meeting room. If joining the meeting in person, the total number of persons, including commissioners, cannot exceed 10, and social distancing will be in effect. The governor of the state of Minnesota has issued Executive Order 20-01, declaring a peacetime emergency and coordinating Minnesota's strategy to protect Minnesotans from COVID-19. On March 24th, the Pine County Board of Commissioners declared a local emergency for Pine County. Based on these conditions, the chair of the Pine County Board of Commissioners has determined that the requirements of Minnesota Statute 13D-021, Subdivision 1, have been met and is not practical or prudent for all members of the County Board to meet in person. And then it uh, goes on, the public is invited to join the meeting in person or remotely, and the phone calls are, or phone numbers are listed. Um, Anyway, I would like to call the meeting to order and we'll rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. That's almost hard to do when you got um, <laughs> a lot of different voices coming in. Anyway, um, public forum. Is anybody on the line or in person that wishes to speak in public forum? Mr. Chair, there is no public in the meeting room. Okay. Sheriff Nelson is the only other person in the meeting room. All right. Uh, we'll move to adopt the agenda. Are there any additions or corrections? Uh, Mr. Chair, with the investment uh, finance committee report, there is a resolution number 20-36 for consideration that's not called out on the agenda as an action item. So I just wanted to draw your attention uh, that it was in the packet and it is an action item. What was the number, Dave? The number is 20-36. And it's related to the liquor licensing renewal fees. Thank you. Any other? <clears throat> if not, we'll look for a motion to adopt the agenda. But we will move as amended. Mick Ross, second. Got a motion by Ludwig, second by Mick Ross. And any discussion? If not, the clerk will call the roll. Roxanne, do you know how that works? I do. Uh, District 4, Commissioner Mickrod. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Hallen. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Chafee. Okay, thank you. Okay, that passes. We'll move to approval of the minutes of the June 2nd County Board minutes and summary for pub publications. Nick, I will move them. Uh, Moral second. Got a motion by Mickrod, second by Moore. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Hallen. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Yes. District 3, Commissioner Chafee. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Mickrod. Aye. That passes. We'll move on to the minutes of Boards, reports, and correspondence, which include the Pine County Housing Redevelopment Authority, HRA, 
uh, meeting minutes from February 26th and April 22nd, 2020. Pine County Zoning Board minutes of April 23rd, 2020, and Initiative Foundation correspondence of May 19th, 2020. Uh, and the Pine County Chemical Health Coalition minutes, June 8th, 2020, and the City of Sandstone Wellhead Protection Plan, Part 2, of June 8th, 2020. Ludwig will move. Moral we'll, we'll take Chafee on that one. Ludwig moves, Chafee seconds. Any discussion? If not, clerk call the roll. District 1, Chair Hallen. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. District 3, Commissioner Chafee. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Mikrot. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. Okay, that passes and we'll move on to the consent agenda. Hopefully you've all looked through that. There is one uh, large expenditure in there, that, but it's not a surprise. We've been working on this for a couple of years and that is the squad and body cameras. Um, so uh, we are moving ahead with that and ready to um, begin uh, the, the uh, ordering of those. So we need moral, to... moral move the consent agenda. Okay. Micro second. Got a motion by Moore, second by Micra for the consent agenda. Any discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. <clears throat> Three, Commissioner Chafee. Aye. District four, Commissioner Micra. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Helen. Yes. So now we can get to the meat of the agenda. Not that the other stuff is not important, but we'll get a report uh, from the facilities committee. Uh, hey, Matt, you want to kind of go with that a little bit? I'm still trying to find my notes here and then I can fill in. I, I can't. Sure. Um, we had our meeting on June 3rd. And of course, we discussed the, the COVID and what's going on in the county and the plexiglass that's getting added here and there. And we're looking at putting up permanent glass um, barriers in the courtrooms and in the courthouse, the front counter, the row counter, and some of the jail. Um, the glass barriers will be added protection and will enhance the worker safety of that area. And, and it's our belief that the work we do will be covered under the CARES Act, and we're um, getting some updated quotes on that. Commissioner? Can, can we just back up and make sure that there's clarity on the proposal for the permanent glass? Sure. That this would be in front of the row offices, auditor, treasurer, reporter, assessor, land and zoning, and it would be installed, it'd be 36 inches high with a four inch gap from the bottom of the glass to the counter. And so it wouldn't be full uh, protection, but it would be a barrier for viral aerosol transmission as well, uh, an enhancement for security for people couldn't jump over the counter or throw things, uh, et cetera. So it, it is a, a somewhat of a security upgrade, uh, but it will permanently change the look and feel of the front uh, office area there. Thank you. Yeah, I was I could go into more detail, I suppose. But, um, and uh, jail, of course, is uh, 
Uh, On-site visiting is appointment only, so I believe so. Um, and the um, court also has been open to the public for walk-in since June 1st, we know all that. So the, the meat and potatoes of the meeting, I thought, was um, when we talk about the court, the new courthouse in the South Pine County Government Center and um, how we're working on, you know, getting employees back into the new courthouse and the number of employees that are working out um, teleworking or remote working or whatever you want to call it. So um, we're looking at changing the, the well, you would remember it as the old social services part of, in the new building, um, reestablishing that as the social services again or, or whatever department it's going to be from health and human services. And we can fit 30 to 35 in there roughly. And um, some staff may be moved to the North Pine Government Center and then the rest of the staff will probably continue to work remotely and report in as needed. Basically hop, hot seat some of the um, cubicles or office space that can be there. Um, so that, and then uh, there was some discussion about the opening of SWCD and then um, the County Administrator David Minky had, they had, had um, shared discussion with uh, the SWCD had Jill that they could open when they felt comfortable and in a manner that they felt comfortable on the sheriff's office building up in Sandstone. Um, we reviewed and looked at the telework planning and impacts. There's a study there and a policy that we looked at, and I think that's, I think that's developing pretty nicely. Which, gosh, that, I mean, it was pretty thought out, and we. Um, discuss the, some of the utilities that are taking place at the North or at the North Pine Government Center on this building, and the, the flagpole is included to uh, make a, get a taller flagpole. And the way the utilities are, we were we were we were thinking about moving the flagpole to a different location, but the underground utilities are in, in the way, and so we're just going to use that same base where this one is, and just have it put a taller flagpole on that, which makes the most sense. And we also discussed um, the signage out by Highway 61 and uh, North Highway 23 out there. So that's marked out there. Yeah. I, I can't think of anything else. You got anything you want to add, Josh? Well, I'd just like to say we've been thinking about that glass on them row offices for quite a while. And yeah. um, obviously taxes are a hot topic um, as we seen last night. So. Um, a little bit of a barrier for for people like that that would just lose their mind coming into the coming into the row offices. I think is nothing but added protection um, for the for the people that are there. So I think it's obviously something that needs to be done, and and I appreciate the staff looking into it, and getting it done. So yeah. Otherwise, I that's that's all I I thank thank you. I do have a question for you and Becky and uh, probably anybody, but as we, as we plan to transition to more home permanent office space, um, those, those people that need to come in occasionally, will there be a designated spot? I heard you talk about more of a hot seat where they would be shared with several people. That's just um, my idea. Is that is that what we're thinking, or will will if I was a home worker, would I have a little corner of a of a place where I could come and set my laptop up and work in the courthouse if I had to be in court? Yeah. Or Mr. Chair, members of the yeah. board, this is Dave Minky. So, if the short answer is it depends, right? But yeah. looking at the workers who are primarily teleworkers, meaning that they work at home except under special circumstances. They might need to come in periodically for meetings or, or whatever it is. Their regular workplace is at home. They will not have an assigned workstation at a county facility. 
we will have a series of shared workstations that they would use. And it's it's called hoteling in the telework yep. world. So you would yep. bring your laptop, we'd have it set up uh, with docking stations and all of that so people could you know, do their work uh, when they needed to do that. But we gain the efficiency of not having everyone have an assigned office space that way. And that's what makes uh, the space work. Right. And I, and I do understand that it's probably still a work in progress and will continue yeah. to be for a while. The, the other question to that is if, in, in my mind, as we transition to that, we're going to need more IT help. Do we have enough space for IT or do we have to look at expansion in that area? Mr. Chair, members of the board, so we would we would have enough space to add another IT staff without having to add uh, any facility uh, additions. And okay. IT, uh, IT can be pretty mobile as well. Right. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Chase, I do have a quick question. Um, you're talking about putting glass on all the offices that are in the front there, like the auditor, all along there, correct? Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. Okay, so I guess my next, my question is then, and, and maybe this is for David too, you know, what kind of protection do we have in the administrator's office for somebody like Jen, who really does meet the public? Or is there talk about putting anything up there? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Chafee, at this point, we have not discussed uh, security enhancements in those areas. Uh, we have a few of those places. Uh, extension would be another one uh, where there is walk-in traffic to uh, what is a small office. Uh, and so we certainly can keep that in mind as we move forward. For And I guess just uh, for the coronavirus response, we do have portable plexiglass shields that we've deployed to various places. Uh, so they're not, a, they're not a security enhancement, but they are a barrier for aerosol transmission. Yeah, and I'm thinking more of that than probably security when it comes to some of these other offices, like, you know, your uh, the administrator or, or those other offices, David, you know, um, and you've got something in place. I didn't know if you did, so I was just curious. Yep. And I, in fact, I can send you a photo of what we have set up uh, just so you have a, an idea what it is. Yeah, that'd be fine. I just was curious if they were, you know, what you were doing on that. So, thank you. Steve, Steve, it, the, um, Chafee, there's going to be some security to this glass, but it's not like bulletproof grass, glass or anything like that. You know, it's, it's like a tempered um, type glass, so it's clear. You'll see through it a slot to pass paper underneath, and it's, so it's... There is some level of security. They can't jump onto the counter and get at anyone. It works like that. So, right. No, and I understand that. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Thank you. It looks like we have no action that needs to take place. But thanks for that good report and keep us up to date. Uh, I do have one more question. Maybe I missed it, but as we transition people to that back hallway. Are we still thinking of, of making a more direct route into that area? Or are we still people going to go around? I think right now it's go around. Uh, okay. And Mr. Chair, Commissioner Ludwig, I don't know that we have, we don't have the floor plan finalized. In the previous iteration where we were talking about adding an annex, and adding some of the HHF staff to the existing courthouse. We did talk about some uh, interior changes that would give HHS space at the front counter so that when you walked in the doors, you could access uh, HHS. And so we're gonna, we're gonna review all of that and figure out how to best serve the public uh, with the changes that we're proposing. I, I understand you guys are doing an awesome job in it. You can't figure it out in, in an hour or two. And and I know sometimes the best plans you make, you have to modify them three months into working with it. So anyway, thanks for the work.
Uh, investment uh, Finance Committee met. Uh, the minutes are attached. Uh, I think it was an interesting meeting, and, and we live in interesting times. And um, if you're if you're on the borrowing end of of finances, it's probably a good time. Uh, if you if you got a a way to pay back your debt, if you're us who have some money to invest as a county because it comes in and then we get a big lump here and then we parcel it out for a few months and then we get another big wad of it. Um, so we have money to invest. We we just our our investment return has pretty much gone in the tank. Does that summarize it, Kelly? Yeah. So so we we at times probably could make two or three percent of our total levy dollars on interest. Um, but I think we'll be lucky to make what one percent as of now. I think I think the one topic of discussion, and Matt, maybe you want to talk about, uh, is the um, abatement of of the liquor tax, the the ones that the county has control over, which are are only the liquor stores that um, do not have a local jurisdiction that grants them a license. And how many are there, Kelly? 10, 12? 13. 13. Well, I was close. But anyway, Matt, do you want to? Yeah, I can take it a little bit. So there, with COVID and business being shut down, um, and of course, we know the off sale remained open so it is, isn't impacted the same as the people that were off sale only so we discussed that what we could do because of the licensure as an annual license that um, you know to sell the liquor so because of there was a three-month um, closure due to COVID we decided to abate um, three months from the license fee of $1,500 which turns out to be $375 so for those those businesses that were had to be closed, their annual license is going to cost them one thousand one hundred and twenty-five dollars instead of fifteen hundred dollars. Not much, but um, it's, it's not fair to have them pay the license tax basically if they're not able to have a business open. So that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? I, I think so, and it, it just the mechanics of it. They will not get a check. They will get a reduction on their new license. Right, right. So if if they were in business and now they're not going to be in business, they will not get a check back, right? That's correct the way the resolution is written. Right. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I just like to say thanks to the investment committee because I think that was a pretty good way of looking at that, and hopefully the businesses that were affected do appreciate it because that I think that's pretty thoughtful and a good way to go. So thank you guys. Well, thank you. Thanks, thanks to Kelly to do she she did the legwork on it, and uh, it just seems to make you know we're we're just trying to be sensible. And, I, and, it, and it's not it's not going to put us in bankruptcy. It's not going to keep them out of bankruptcy. But I think it's a it's a gesture of good faith. So, um, are you going to talk about, Mr. Chair? Are you are you going to talk about the Ellers thing? Or? Yeah, you can you can take that one, Matt. Okay. Yeah. So we also had discussion on our um, the courthouse. Um, bonds that we were issued in 2012 when we read in at that time and the rates are coming down so we have a call date of February 1st 2021 where we could refinance and we if we do that and we can save six hundred and sixty three thousand dollars well over that actually six sixty three one sixty five 
is the savings week. So we're going to do that. And we also had some discussion about, um, you know, lowering the timeline with those dollars up. Um, it made the most sense just to keep the loan term the same and save the money over the length of the, the loan. Um, Kelly, is there anything I should add to that? That's kind of the way I understand that. Yeah, I think that's a good start. The only other tidbit I guess I would add is that we can't start that process till 90 days before that call of February 1st, 2021. Right. So come right. about October, um, we'll start to talk about it more in depth. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'd like to circle back to uh, resolution 20-36. And that is in your packet. We would uh, recommend that as a um, so if somebody would like to make a motion to that effect. I'll move. Ludwig will move that, Mr. Chair. Okay. Do I hear a second? Moral second. And more seconds yeah. it. Is there any discussion on that? Pardon me. So somebody said something. You might be hearing from people in the lobby here, Steve. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, if, if no more discussion, the clerk will call the roll. District three, Commissioner Chafee. District Commission Cheney. Yeah, sorry, I got I lost you guys. Uh, uh, I. Okay. I think we're voting. Up. <laughs> could you, could you, where where are we at? Because I lost. We're you. we're voting on the on the uh, resolution to abate the uh, taxes for three months okay. to the liquor stores that were okay. affected. That's what I. Think. Yep. I. Okay. Sorry about District that. Okay, thank you. District 4, Commissioner Mikrat. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Hallen. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Yes. Okay, we'll move on to the first. Mr. Panel. Chair? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, we, we discussed one more thing, uh, that restricted fund balance. Oh, yes. Thank and the you. county has a lot of restricted funds and, you know, money that can't be spent. And um, Auditor Schroeder revisited that with us and suggested that when we come to our budget discussions, that we have a committee meeting that's just devoted to what we do with our restricted funds. So I want to throw that out there, too. Yep. A good point. Thank you for oh, okay. remembering that. Now we will move on to the personnel committee report. Does Chief, you want to give it? Or I would, I would, but I might lose you right in the middle of it. I've lost you guys about three times now. So. Okay, I'll, I'll take it then. If you. So we met on June 9th, um, and. We made the following recommendations from the county attorney's office. We acknowledge the retirement of county attorney office manager Terry Jansen, effective July 31st, 2020, and authorize the backfill of the position and any subsequent vacancies due to internal promotion or lateral transfer. In the jail, we acknowledge the resignation of correction officer Jennifer Neal, effective June 5th, 2020 and authorize the backfill of the position and any subsequent vacancies due to internal promotion or lateral transfer. In zoning, we acknowledge the resignation of environmental technician Linda Hart, effective June 12, 2020, and authorize the backfill of the position and any subsequent vacancies that may occur. And we also approve the restructure of the current zoning and environmental technician support position including additional job duties, revised job description, 
title change to zoning and solid waste technician, and grade change from a five minimum starting wage of 1846 to a seven of a starting wage of 20.74 per hour. Um, the current um, job incumbent, Joy Hicks, will receive a pay increase from 22.45 per hour to 23.40 per hour, effective July 1st, 2020. Her anniversary date will remain the same. And we approved the newly created zoning and solar waste support specialist position, which is a AFSME road and bridge contract grade four, starting wage of 17.41 per hour, and along with the proposed job description. And Mr. Chair, I will move that. Chafee second. Okay, we got a motion by Ludwig, second by Chafee. Is there any discussion, questions? If not, the clerk will call the roll. District 4, Commissioner Mickrod. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Hallen. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Yes. District 3, Commissioner Chafee. Aye. Okay. <laughs> Performance management program participation. Mr. Chair, this is County Auditor Treasurer Kelly Schroeder. We'll take that. Um, and so before you, you have a res you have resolution 2020-35, um, which just authorizes us to continue to participate in um, this program. Um, and it is a program that I was made aware of last year. It's through the state auditor's office. Um, they had developed um, a performance measurement program back in 2010 um, through the local council or the Council on Local Results and Innovation. Um, and by participating in that program, you look at 10 different measures um, of the county. And so that was included in the packet. But I will also put it up on the screen here so you can see it. Um, of the measures that we looked at, and because we participated last year we can compare where we were last year in 2018 to where we ended up in 2019. we're hoping you all can see that yes yes, yes. Probably we can see that okay. yep it sounds good so we, we we look at these different measures so the program has 27 different areas that you can look at um, for a county. You only have to pick 10 of them. So these are the 10 that we used last year and we're using again this year. Um, and so you can kind of go down the list. Um, you have to pick at least one thing from each category. So you can see like public safety, public work, public health. Um, you know, we had to pick something from each category. And so we just compare from last year to this year. Um, and it's something that it's just gonna give us a lot of information over the years of participating in it. Um, kind of some things that I found kind of as highlights. So like public works, um, average bridge sufficiency went up. Um, I know we had some bridge, re bridge replacements. Mark's chair is empty, so he can't really talk to that right now, but um, we had we had you know a bridge replacement that I'm assuming helped out with that. Um, same with as you kind of go down the list, um, like elections, um, the accuracy of the post-election um, auditor review. Um, so you know, that went up. The percentage of veterans receiving federal benefits, I was kind of excited to see that went up. I mean, it didn't go up huge, but it went up some. Um, and so you can kind of see too, um, you know, the changes over the years. By participating in this program, we get, we we're, we're <coughs> accumulating this information over the years to be able to see how we're doing. And then we also do get a little bit additional local or county program aid for participating. So we get about $4,000 additional for participating in this program. Um, and in the end, I mean, it probably only took me a couple of year, a couple hours to pull it together. So it sure seems worth it. Um, questions on that? I I like it, Kelly. I think we should probably. I don't know how we how we publish that more. Get a, a graph, so it's easily understood. But you know, we do track the important <coughs> sectors of what we do, and we're always seeking improvement. 
and that's the whole idea of this thing. Right. Absolutely. And so we as part of the program, you do have the requirement to to publish it and put it out to the public. So there is a section on the auditor page of the county website that goes through the program and our results are there. Um, but it's definitely something we can find other ways to think about too. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes. Commissioner um, Ludwig. So Kelly, do we have to um, do this resolution every year then? Correct, yes. So the it's, you have to do the resolution to participate every year and the resolution also commits to publishing the data, which I mean, you can publish it just at a public meeting or on the county website. So now we're, and we're doing both. You can put it in the newspaper too, but um, that's expensive. So this seems like the best route to talk about it at this public meeting and then put it on the website. Um, and so you do have the resolution before you this morning too. So we thank you. We will need a motion for this resolution 2020 35. More. Ludwig will move it. Oh. Ludwig moves. I'll second. More. More seconds. Any discussion? Questions? Clerk will call the roll. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Hallen. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Yes. District 3, Commissioner Chafee. Aye. District 4, Commissioner McRod. Aye. And... Now we'll move on to the election overview. So Mr. Chair, this is County Auditor Treasurer Kelly Schroeder again. Um, so I have a PowerPoint I'm gonna put up here and then we'll kind of we'll go through it. Um, so I think that you guys can all see that now. Um, wave or something yes, if we you can. can. Okay, super. Um, so we are in 2020, and so we, I think that everybody knows we have an election this year. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you an overview of the election process and, and where we're at. Um, so moving on, in 2020, we have three elections, one of which we've already completed. Um, so on March 3rd, there was the presidential nomination primary. Um, and so that was a unique experience in Minnesota um, where citizens had to actually declare what party ballot they wanted. Um, and, and it was a little bit of a, a painful process for some voters um, in Pine County and across the state uh, because they weren't understanding that. that. Um, hearing from the Secretary of State and the legislature, they are thinking that this is gonna be here to stay, um, which, is, which is interesting to me because it was a very expensive process. Um, but we'll, we'll see, we've got four years to see if it's really gonna stay. Um, and then coming up, we've got the August 11th primary election. And then of course the November 3rd um, general election. And we'll dig into those a little bit more here. Um, the August primary election, we actually already have ballots for those. And so in front of you, you have Pine County sample ballots. Um, there's only two offices that are on the primary election. Um, so the U.S. Senator and the U.S. Representative are the only offices that are included on that ballot. You only end up with primary um, primaries when there is more, there is at least double the amount of candidates um, for an office. So if you're voting for one, if there is at least four candidates, then so you would end up with a primary election. Um, one question as you're looking at this, you might think, oh, but when you look at that first side of the ballot, you've only got one person on each of each of those for the legal marijuana now party and the grassroots legal cannabis party. Um, and those, so statute requires if an office is on the ballot, no matter what party it is, if it's a major political party, it also has to be on the ballot. Um, so those are a little goofy, especially because they're on the ballot, but yet there's only one person there. Um, and so that's, hopefully it's not gonna be overly confusing to, to voters. Um, they can only vote in one party here. 
Um, so they need to pick their side and pick their column and stay in that column, otherwise their ballot won't be counted. Um, questions with that at all? Okay, we'll move on. Um, and then we have the November general election. Um, and so many of these, these, um, many of these offices already had their filing that ended on June 2nd. So everything in the first column on the left was already needed to be filed for by June 2nd, all the way up to the SWCD supervisors had to be filed by June 2nd. Um, and so those, we already know who's running for those offices and, um, and so those will be on the general election. Uh, for the hospital districts, the city offices, and then those townships that have elected to have a November election, um, those have a later filing period that starts the end of July and then runs through August 11th. Um, and so we'll see as, as we get closer to see who's running for those seats. Um, and so it's a little bit of a process for that November election to, to pull together. Any questions on that? All right, we'll continue on. Um, one thing this year with COVID, um, there was a lot of discussion about the voting process and how to make it a um, more safe process health-wise for folks. And I heard a lot of things on the news, a lot of things out in social media about voter fraud and how those things happen. Um, so there's a lot I wanted to just touch on on how Minnesota's system works. Um, it's really interesting to me that Every state has a different election system. Um, and so things that can't state just can't happen in Minnesota or another state because of the processes we have in place. Um, so the first step of voting is obviously to, to register to vote. Um, there's several ways to register to vote. The first one is a paper application. So we've got them in our office. Um, a lot of different places just mail them out to people. Um, those paper applications would come back to our office. Um, and then we would process them. Um, there's an online application. I've got the link there, but we don't need to click on it or anything. Um, and so that online application is, is a little, we like to see people use that because then we don't have to enter the data from the paper application, um, but some people aren't comfortable with that as well. Um, and then in Minnesota, we also do allow people to register on election day, which is something unique to Minnesota and a lot of states don't allow um, and so that it, it's the same process as the paper application, it's just that you're doing it on election day. Um, who can vote? Um, and so this is something that we get a lot of questions on. So obviously you have to be a US citizen to be able to vote. You have to have a social security number or a driver's license generally, um, or like a Minnesota ID card um, to be able to vote. And so to be able to get one of those, you need to be a US citizen. Um, you have to be 18 years old on election day. Um, and so if your birthday, if you've got somebody who's turning 18 in, se in September of this year, for example, they would not be able to vote in the primary election, but would be able to vote in the November general election. Um, and then in Minnesota, you have to be a resident hero for at least 20 days. And so there are still ways to, if you don't have a Minnesota driver's license, you can, because you just moved here, you can still get registered to vote with like a Wisconsin driver's license and then a piece of mail showing that you, you now reside here. Um, and then you also cannot be under a felony sentence. And so that means just because you've been convicted of a felony, that doesn't, that doesn't mean you, you've lost your voting rights. If, if you, if you parts of your sentence, so you've completed your probation and all of that is, is if it's in the past, you can now vote. Um, and then also people under guardianship can ask also actually still vote as long as a judge has not removed their voting rights. Um, and so it's, Minnesota is a very, we want to give people the opportunity to vote that we can. Hmm? But as the next slide shows, we are also very careful about it. Um, and so when people register to vote, they have to provide proof of their name and address. So that is a lot of times some sort of photo ID um, and then possibly like a utility bill or like a tuition statement for college students. Um, there's a lot, I mean, there's a huge list of different things that you have to, you can show to be able to register to vote. 
Um, and then once you register to vote, actually the state system checks that information against the driver's license and social security databases to make sure the information matches those databases. Um, it also checks against the Department of Health deceased records. Um, you hear you hear that a lot out on social media and things of, oh, my dead grandpa voted in the last election. Well, in Minnesota, that can't happen um, because our voting records are checked against the Department of Health deceased, deceased records. Um, and then we also monthly get a report from the Department of Corrections to make sure that felons are not voting. Um, and so that's something that we go through every month and make sure that we flag anybody who has a new felony conviction um, and then we also have to take some folks off who have completed their felony, um, their felony sentences. And then along with all of those things, then also additionally, once someone is registered to vote, they get a postcard verification that's mailed to their registered address as a double check. Um, so if we mail those cards out and we get it back, your registration is then not completed. Um, so it's very hard for someone to to fraudulently register to vote in Minnesota um, because we have all those checks in place and then the very last step a postcard is going to be mailed and if the post office can't deliver it because that's not a correct address, you don't live there, um, your mail is being forwarded, we'll get it returned and then your registration wouldn't be processed. Any questions with that registration piece? All right, we'll move on. Kelly? Uh, yeah. Um, my question is is about um, people that don't live all year long in, the, let's, let's say they go to Texas in the end of October. I, then they can vote early, correct? Correct, yep. And we're going to go it through that, that process okay, here. Okay, I'll wait, I'll season. wait. Yep. Here we go, Steve. All right. Um, here are the options on how people can vote. So um, in Minnesota through 2016, we had what was called absentee voting. So you had to have a reason that you needed to vote absentee. You were gonna be absent from, from, the, from the, the polling place. Um, and then in 2016, we switched to actually early voting so that it's just no excuse absentee. Anyone can go vote early up to 46 days before the election. Um, in Pine County, we also have mail ballot districts, which are pretty prevalent and we'll, we'll go through that. Um, but um, ballots are actually just automatically mailed to all registered voters. And then of course, you also can vote in person on election day at polling places. Um, so dig in, to dig into those kind of options, so the early voting or the old, what was called the absentee process, um, you no longer need an excuse to be able to vote early in Minnesota. Um, there is an application you have to complete um, to request a ballot. And so there's two ways to do that. There's a paper application, so folks can call our office, we can mail it out. Um, this year, a lot of people maybe are getting these envelopes in the mail um, from different organizations. This one's from the Center of Voter Information, and it includes an absentee ballot. Um, <laughs> An early voting application. Um, and so these applications, the paper applications get completed and mailed back to our office. Um, we are getting an inundated phone calls with um, people getting these, these courtesy absentee ballot applications mailed to them, wondering if they're legitimate um, and why they're getting them. And it, it comes down to there's these nonprofit organizations that just want to make sure everybody who wants to vote can vote. Um, and so they purchase a registered voter list from the Secretary of State and literally mail, mail the, the absentee ballot applications out to everyone. Um, there's an envelope included that comes back to our office, so it really is a legitimate thing. Um, but it, it, it creates a lot of work for our office because then we get a massive amount of absentee ballot applications, which this year maybe is okay because some of those folks probably shouldn't be going to the polling place. Um, those paper applications are, are, are 
a lot of work for us though because then we have to enter all of the information again into the state system um, where the process that we we prefer is the online application and so i've got the link up here but you literally click on it and you put in your name and address and your driver's license number and that's going right into the state state system and then we can process it from there so it it takes a step away from us and so we like that route um and so once those applications are are submitted to our office then we still begin to process them um i already mentioned but i'll go over it again um you can may you can vote earlier vote absentee 46 days before an election so for the primary election, the August 11th primary election that begins June 26th, so that's already next Friday. So we are gearing up in major election mode in my office. Um, and then for the general election that starts September 18th, the 46 days. Um, and so absentee or early voting is very similar actually to mail balloting. The process is very similar. Um, the only, the only difference for mail balloting, which is my last my last bullet point, is that you don't have to complete that application if you're in a mail ballot district. Um, if you're registered to vote at least 21 days before the election, we just automatically mail you a ballot. Um, in Pine County, we, we now have 20 of our 47 townships and cities that are actually using this process, um, which is about 13.8% um, of the registered voters. So, yep, it's almost half of our jurisdictions, but yet it's a small percentage. Um, and that is because um, the statute only allows townships and cities under 400 voters to go through that process, um, which we really appreciate because it is a, it's a lot of work for our office um, to process those mail ballots and get them mailed out. Um, folks in mail ballot districts, they, also, they can choose to vote in person. Um, however, they're polling place is at the courthouse. So for the folks in Nickerson, when they don't wanna vote at their kitchen table and they wanna come to a polling place, they do have to come to the courthouse. And so we do hear a little bit of um, people a little unhappy with that, but they can vote at their kitchen table. So um, I guess it, if it were my choice, that's what I would choose. So, um, so that voting by mail process, so that includes the early voting, the absentee voting, and the mail ballots. Um, so when, when our office puts those together, they receive one large envelope, and it has this logo, this official election mail logo on it. Um, and the post office requires us to put that on all envelopes that include anything election so that they know to handle them with their proper procedures. Um, in the large envelope that folks will get included in that is instructions on what to do with everything that's in that envelope. If the person is not registered to vote, they will receive a voter registration application. They'll receive a ballot in there, they'll receive an envelope, a secrecy envelope, and an I voted sticker. And we'll go through those envelopes here in just a second. And so when, when people choose to vote by mail or we have those mail ballot districts, they do get quite the packet. But we hope we we intentionally assemble them in a certain way that hopefully walks people through through what they need to do. Um, and then, of course, our phone number is still in there as well if people have questions. Um, and so the first place, the first thing that folks need to do is fill out this signature envelope. And when they get it, it already has a sticker on it, like I'm showing on the screen that has the voter's name and address on it. The voter then needs to insert either their driver's license number, their Minnesota ID card, or their last four of their social security number. And then the voter needs to sign it at the X. And then this is the place that people get a little tripped up on. They have to have someone witness their, their ballot. So that witness has to look at the ballot first to make sure that it's blank before they vote, um, to make sure that there's, there's, not, there's not fraud or anything going on. And then once that voter marks the ballot in private, the voter will put it in the secrecy envelope, which is the tan envelope that's included, and they'll seal it in there. And then on the signature envelope, that witness will actually complete their name, their address, and then sign that they witness that person, the person whose name is on the envelope, they witness them that they had a blank ballot, they completed it, put it in the signature, the secrecy envelope, and then they are signing off that they witnessed that. Um, that is a little bit of a place that trips some folks up um, because 
it some folks live on their own and they don't have someone to witness because spouse i mean it's fine for spouses to witness the person does have to be registered to vote in minnesota if they're witnessing they or they have to be a notary generally so like we've got some people who winter um down in southern states and so they they find somebody there that's also from minnesota or they just go to a notary at a local bank and have them do it um We've got some older people too in some of our outlying areas that struggle a little bit with this, but we we work with our townships and things to make sure that we are able to find them someone to be able to witness. Um, when these ballots, and so this is actually the envelope that also when it gets mailed to them, it has postage on it. So this is the envelope and like our address to return it back to us. And so this is the envelope that comes back to us with everything inside. Um, and then when folks mail it back to us, another question or another thing that you saw on social media is that, oh, my ballot didn't even get counted because it was left at the post office. Well, in Minnesota, we have a neat track your ballot tool. Um, and so it kind of almost works like if you've ever tracked a package through the post office or anything like that. So you literally can follow it from the point that you submit your application for the ballot. And it says, okay, the county's received your application. Oh, the county has processed your application. Oh, the county mailed your ballot this day. Um, and so really we've got a lot of safeguards in, in place in Minnesota for people to be able to know if their ballot has come back to the county's office. Um, and so there are requirements for when those ballots need to be back to the county office to be able to be counted on election day. Um, they do have to be back by election day. Um, and so that was something like with our special elections we had last year, we struggled a little bit with because those time frames were so short, um, people really struggled to be able to mail them back to us fast enough and have us receive them by election day. Um, when we receive those ballots back, the absentee ballot board reviews envelopes to make sure that they're completed properly. So we're looking to make sure that there's an ID number or driver's license number put in there. The voter has signed and that they've had a witness and the witness has completed everything correctly. Um, at the point that there's two people that serve on that absentee ballot board, two people look at the envelope and decide whether it's acceptable or not. If it's accepted, great, it goes into the ballot box to be weighted to be counted on election day. If it's rejected, then our procedure is to be to try to contact that voter to explain to them what the problem is. Sometimes it's a super easy problem um, in that we just can't read their witness name and they can just tell it us to us over the phone and then oh yeah we can make out now that we know that it's john smith we now know we can understand that it's john smith otherwise sometimes we just need to talk the voter through it and send them a replacement replacement ballot um and we by statute have to send them replacement ballots if there's an issue with their ballot we have to send them a replacement ballot up to five days before um the election day um, so we really do all of our best um, to make sure everybody who's voting by mail, their votes get counted. Um, and those ballots are processed right at the courthouse. So that previously was an issue of those absentee ballots. Um, they were sent out to the polling places to be counted. And that's when you had issues with so-and-so forgot the absentee ballots in their trunk and they were never counted. Um, and so those ballots now, once they're received at the courthouse, they do not leave the courthouse and they're all processed right there. Um, any questions with all of that? All right, we'll continue on. Um, so for those folks that go to the polling place to vote on election day, um, they're greeted by several people working at the polling places. Um, which those folks are called election judges. Um, and there are several different stations of election judges. Um, I've got them listed here. So we've got a head judge, a registration judge, a roster judge, a ballot judge, and then a tabulator judge. In Pine County, most of our polling places only are required to have three or four judges. So you'll, you, you're not gonna see five different election judges generally working in your polling place. 
it might probably be only three or four. And so some of these folks are doubling up on their duties. Um, election judges are something that we're always in short supply of. Um, it's kind of, it's a really, it's a good public service to do. Um, so if you know somebody who is available um, and is willing to serve, it's definitely something that we need more people to serve doing. Um, it's a three hour training, the end of July, and then you'd work on, on the, the primary election day or the general election day, and you are paid by the townships and cities to serve. Um, state statute also requires um, employers to allow you to have time off work to do to serve as an election judge. Um, and so it's something that we want to make sure people know we need more election judges and it's not hard to be an election judge. So make sure to reach out to me um, if you know of somebody um, because we can definitely use you. Um, and then when someone goes to vote in person on election day, um, if they're registered to vote in that precinct at their address, they don't need they don't need to show any ID. They just need to have their name and address. Um, and then that election judge will find them on what's called the roster, which I'm showing a sample roster below. And so that that judge, that election judge will find them on the roster and verify their address and then have the voter sign next to their name, certifying that they are themselves and that they are able to vote in Minnesota. Um, if they're if they're not registered to vote, then they need to be registered to vote. And so then they go through the vote registration process that same day. Um, and so um, we'll kind of, we'll move on from that. Um, in Minnesota, um, a lot of you maybe have seen these in your polling places. They're called auto mark machines. Um, this was a requirement in 2006, well, for the 2006 election cycle, these had to be in every polling place in Minnesota. And so they're assisted, vo assisted voting devices. And so you insert your ballot in there and then you can see the headphones in the picture. It can read the ballot to you in case you're, you have trouble seeing. Um, it can, um, it enlarges the ballot so that you, for those that have trouble, um, it has um, it has a lot of different features. It's got some contrast features to make the ballot easier to see. And what it does, it, it simply marks the ballot for the person. So once once they put the ballot in there, they make their choices. It actually fills in the ovals for the person and then prints it back out for them. Um, and so these machines are getting rather outdated. Um, and so now that we've had the same machine since 2006, so they're 14 years old, um, and technology that's 14 years old um, maybe doesn't always work the best. Um, and so it's something that I have on my radar to start to think about how do we start to replace these machines because we are required to have them in the polling places um, and we, the ones that we have are, are outdated. Um, so we that's something that we're going to keep tabs on. There are some grant funds available to start to help to replace those, but they only cover half the cost. And each machine is about five to six thousand um, dollars. So that is a lot of money when you start to talk about, um, you know, we've got 27 polling places in Pine County. Um, so that's something we'll work on over the next couple of years, though. Um, also, in most polling places, you'll see a vote tabulator, which looks like the on the screen. These are called M100 tabulators. Um, so everyone who votes, they will go insert their ballot into this tabulator and their vote will be counted. Um, some jurisdictions, like for the, for the primary election, we do ha still have six jurisdictions that are pretty small that still hand count their ballots. So they can hand count those really fast versus um, these vote tabulators are again about five to six thousand dollars each and then you've got maintenance on them annually and you've got programming for each election um, so some of those smaller jurisdictions still do just hand count um, but if a precinct has more than 500 registered voters they're actually required to use a tabulator um, and then at the end of the night the election judges actually close out the polls on this machine and it prints out it almost looks like a cash register receipt of all the vote totals. Um, and we'll go through kind of at the end, 
Um, we do do some spot checking to ensure that those ballots were counted correctly by the equipment. Huh? Um, at 8 p.m. everywhere across the state of Minnesota, the votes, the polls close. Um, anyone in line at 8 p.m. can vote. Um, so that's something important to know. Um, if you get there at 7.59 and the line's really long um, and you can't get through the line by 8 p.m., that's okay. You were in line at, at before 8 p.m. you get to vote. Um, and as I mentioned, when we were talking about the tabulator, the results are tabulated at each precinct and polling place. And then they're brought into um, the auditor's office where, where they're uploaded and entered into um, the state system. Um, some jurisdictions, like down in the cities and things, they actually electronically transfer their results to the county. Um, and that's not something that we are set up to do with all the different security features and things like that. Um, and so our election judges physically bring the results into the county and we upload them in, in, um, from the county office. Um, one fun tidbit is that the by state statute, the county auditor cannot leave until leave the courthouse until all the results are reported. Um, so that's a little bit fun because we've had a few townships um, in the past, um, like the 2018 election. We had one clerk who went home to take a nap um, before coming, um, and Kathy ended up calling her and waking her up at about 2 a.m. and telling her that she needed to come. Um, and so that's always an interesting part of the evening is to see how, how when, when you can get out of there. <laughs> Um, and then after the election, some of you, I think a lot of you have had the opportunity to serve on the canvassing board. Um, and so within two to three days after the election, the canvassing board meets and what they do is they review the results that were input into the state system against the results that were reported by the townships and cities. Um, and so that process is used to certify the results to make sure the results work accurately input to the state system. Um, so that's one part of, of the post-election activities. Um, the next part is called the post-election review. And so we manually have to recount two precincts um, for the offices that are listed on the screen. Um, and so that's just a double check of the tabulators to make sure on those precincts there isn't any, there wasn't anything that would have resulted in a change of votes. Um, there are some, there are sometimes automatic recounts that are triggered when there's less than like a quarter of a half a percent or something crazy, a tiny small percent of difference in votes. Um, there are recounts then that have to happen for those entire races. So it's not just that you're looking at the keg of the town presidential race, you'd be looking at the presidential race for every single township and city in Pine County. Um, so that's a recount that's very different than the post election review, because the post election review, you're just looking at two precincts, and those specific races. Um, and then once we get through those two processes, and then a recount, if we end up in that situation, we have to store all election materials for 22 months um, because there could be con contest periods. The state auditor's office also does some audits to make sure that we've accurately processed everything. Um, and so we end up with a lot of storage room of these materials because we have to keep all of the ballots um, and all of the materials from all of those polling places um, for that 22 months. Um, and so that's, something that we're working through in our office and actually um, Heat and Brock just made us a nice storage place for all of that stuff. Um, other than that, I think we made it through the election process. Are there questions from anyone that came up um, as we're going into this election season this year? It took me a while to find the on mute button. <laughs> I, I thank you, Kelly. I'm always amazed that uh, um, I don't know if it's paranoia that takes place on social media about all the voter fraud that happens because I do not see how it can happen where I vote 
and I've been a, on that on that committee that looks at the total county, and I just don't <laughs> understand where they think people can cheat. Right. Yeah. Last summer, Secretary Simon was actually um, at. I think it was. Yeah. I think it was last summer. Was at at Pine Tech, and somebody had asked right. him about it, and he said, "In the last twenty years in Minnesota, they've had seven cases of voter fraud." So, <laughs> it's it's not something that happens in Minnesota. Thank you very much. Anybody got any questions? We will move on to the Namadji One Watershed One Plan summary. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Melanie Bomier from the Carlton Soil and Water Conservation District. And I'm going to present, actually, I can start doing that right now, a presentation about our One Watershed One Plan. Let me just get that started. Um, well, and welcome, welcome. Thank and you. Go right ahead. <laughs> okay. <anxious> to hear. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you um, giving me time on your busy agenda today. So I will try to go through this somewhat fast. I have a tendency to talk fast anyway, so that shouldn't be a problem. But please feel free to interrupt me um, if you have questions. I'll try to make sure I ask them. But um, um, just know that, that that's the case. Um, and I also want to point out that um, the plan is in the draft form right now. Um, we are accepting comments through the end of the month as an internal review. Um, so if you have comments, if you have time to look through the plan, we are accepting those comments. Um, and um, in July, we'll be asking you that once you have a chance to look at the plan to um, make a, re a, a motion for us to proceed with the formal six day review that's required um, for um, moving the plan forward. So we just want to make sure we gave you time to actually look at it before you um, before you made a, a motion on that. Um, I know Pine County is farther along than Carleton County as far as the Marshman plan, so you guys are more likely familiar with this. Um, but uh, just, just an overview of what one Marshman plan is. It's a voluntary program and plan that aligns water planning um, along watershed boundaries versus county boundaries. Um, and it enhances the existing water, county water plans, but it's still local priorities. It's still locally driven. Um, it uses existing authority, authorities and funding mechanisms. It's not adding any new ordinances or rules, um, it, but it's based on that current state data and information that we've been collecting over the last 10 or so years. Um, progress will be monitored and tracked for achieving our measurable goals, which I'll go over in this presentation. And then the biggest thing about this is once it's adopted, um, we'll be eligible for implementation funding um, that's non-competitive. So most of the projects that we do for water resources are through competitive grants, and this will give us a chance to have some non-competitive dollars to do this work. Um, I know maybe some of you aren't just familiar with the NMAGI. Um, it's a smaller part of Pine County, um, but uh, so I'll give you a little overview of the watershed itself. Um, the headwaters of several of our streams are in northeastern Pine County, um, and then the it's the southeastern part of Carleton County. Um, what it's really known for is the red clay soils that are prone to slumping and erosion, um, and also it has really flashy streams and steep banks. Most of that's on the Carleton County side. Um, it's also known for abundant forests, which you're probably familiar with with the Nemagi State Forest. Um, and wetlands, um, but in Carleton County, we also have a diversity of farms. We have um, CSAs and beef, pork, dairy. There's just a lot of um, diverse farms in our in that part of our county. Um, both Carleton and Pine County are involved in this watershed. Um, uh, of course, then it crosses over to Wisconsin and Douglas County, and the um, the Magic River empties into Lake Superior in Superior, Wisconsin. Um, some of the interesting things about the watershed is that it has a ton of trout streams on the Carlton County side uh, that are registered by DNR, but then there are also some really high quality trout streams um, that anglers use. And we also have several wild rice lakes. Um, with all these good things, there are some issues. Um, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has um, listed several of the streams um, as impaired because they have too much sediment in them, which isn't a surprise based on the erosion that we have on those stream banks. Um, and with that soil erosion, we have some phosphorus in some of these streams. We also have E. coli impairments 
and one lake impairment that's on the border of Carleton and Pine Counties, um, Net Lake. So, it's a lot of good things and some issues. As you know, um, this planning effort was started through a memorandum of agreement between Carleton and Pine Counties and SWCDs. That was about a little over a year ago. And just some highlights of the plan itself, what maybe makes it different from other planning efforts. First of all, we realized early on that, you know, we're really excited to be getting some non-competitive implementation dollars for this pro pro project. Um, but we realized that because it's a small watershed and their funding um, mechanisms are based on the amount of land, uh, the number of acres of private land, we weren't gonna be getting a ton of funding. So we really spent a lot of time trying to figure out where to work where we could get the most benefits for each project. Um, also, what was interesting about our One Wash One plan is that um, we collaborated with Wisconsin because obviously they're about half of the watershed. Um, so we had on our advisory committee, um, a city of Superior um, employee, and also we used a tool that was developed by Wisconsin DNR that we were very thankful to have that helped us do prioritization and um, target where we would work. Um, they did work, they had a grant and then they included Minnesota when they did that. Um, we also did a lot of collaboration with rural authorities. Um, in this watershed, we just have a lot of I, opportunities and problems um, with the roads and the streams, the road stream interface. So we worked with the transportation departments, um, MnDOT and townships where, where we have these problems. Um, this plan includes groundwater goals, and this was something that we were sort of surprised that it would be as an important a topic as it was, just because we um, haven't really thought about groundwater as much as maybe we should have been. So um, that was an interesting thing. And then finally, um, the draft plan was completed within a year. So we were really excited that there was a big push, thanks to a lot of um, time put in by our advisory committee and our policy committee, um, we were able to get this done in a timely manner. So we really appreciate that. Okay, so I'm going to, oh, we're going to talk a little bit about how this plan is set up. So if you have time to go through the plan, um, it is set up in topic areas, which may be different than other watershed plans that you have looked at. Um, we started our kickoff bus tour July, in July of last year, and it, we visited different sites based on topic, and it just sort of flowed. That's the way we would set up the plan. So our topic areas in the plan are streams, wetlands, forest, farms, groundwater, and lakes. And I'm going to go through a little bit of each um, of these topics, explain what's highlight what's in the plan. And um, I'm just giving the, uh, you know, uh, um, just a, a small part of what's in the plan. So if you want to know more, you certainly feel free to ask questions or there's a lot more in the plan than what I'll be saying today. Okay, so for our first uh, topic, um, our goal is to reconnect 46 miles of stream to benefit aquatic life, improve the road stream interface, and reduce sediment. So I mentioned that we have this sediment issue in the Nemaji, and I, a lot of people will probably say, well, what do roads have to do with sediment erosion? Um, well, we have had, as, as, as Pine County has had, a lot of big rain events in the last 10 years or so. So we've had a 200 year rain event in 2012, 16, 18, and 19. When that happens, we lose roads in the Nemaji. Um, and so one 200-year uh, rain event results in 600 tons of sediment in our streams. So fixing our road issues will help improve our streams. Um, so the actions associated with this goal is we're going to replace undersized perch to misline culverts, and we're relying heavily on our road authorities to do that work. Um, in this watershed, we also have some legacy dams that were built, and actually they're, they were built to... Um, to improve water quality. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, um, but we would like to remove those where we can because they have, pose a big risk to sediment erosion in our watersheds. Um, we also recognize that there's a lot of road gravel that, get wa that gets washed in the streams um, in these steep slopes. So if we can stabilize that, we can save a lot of sediment in our streams. And um, we also, we have a lot of unstable stream banks throughout the watershed. We could, we could do work and many, many places, but we're gonna focus where we can um, uh, secure infrastructure in this case. So our outcomes that we hope to achieve by this is to improve public safety, reduce sediment erosion to our streams and eventually to Lake Superior, improve habitat for fish and aquatic life, um, protection of commerce, because we need to be able to get around if we wanna do business, 
And um, we're going to mitigate climate change impacts since we have these big rain events coming more frequently. Um, we'll be able to uh, deal with that better if we have properly sized culverts. For wetlands, so we have a goal of increasing storage in our, our watershed um, by about 1,100 acre feet. And that is worded that way because it's a requirement for the plan through the Board of Water and Soil Resources. Um, so when I think of storage, I don't think of acre feet. Um, what is that? Well, it's about a football field covered in one foot of water. Um, so we, our goal is to increase watershed storage by restoring wetlands. Um, and why, why do we want more watershed storage? Well, unfortunately, we are most of us are probably have heard the flatten the curve um, because of the pandemic, but it actually works really um, well at explaining why we want um, more watershed storage. So, um, you know, in a normal flood event right now in the Nemaji, all that water comes at once, it hits those streams and it washes out infrastructure because we have so much of it, it's so flashy. Uh, but if we can hold that water in the landscape longer, we can reduce those flood impacts to our infrastructure. Um, and so that's, that's basically what we're trying to do. Um, now, I mentioned a moment ago about these red clay dams. In the 1970s, their idea to um, do this was to install these dams on streams to um, hold that water back. And while that worked, um, it left this legacy of maintenance that um, isn't sustainable for our district. And so why we chose wetlands as a way to increase that storage is, is that it requires a lot less um, long-term maintenance that we will have to deal with in the future. We don't want to leave that for the people who come after us. Um, so um, that, yeah, that's our wetland goal. And so the um, outcomes that we hope to achieve by this um, is to protect vulnerable infrastructure. I, I actually didn't mention that, but um, where we want to restore these wetlands would be upstream of vulnerable infrastructure. Specifically, we're looking, at, for example, we're looking at County Road 8, um, which is an east-west road in the watershed. Um, it has many culverts to blow out because basically it's acting as a barrier for water trying to flow north to Lake Superior. So if we can hold more water back from that road, then we can um, we can help protect that infrastructure. Um, again, mitigating climate change impacts and reducing sediment erosion. Um, most of the erosion that's happening in Magi, the vast majority of that erosion is coming from the in the channel. It's not washing off construction sites or farm fields. It's eroding in the channel itself. So if we can slow the flow of water, we will slow reduce those impacts because we have the most channel erosion during high flow events. Uh, the other the other side, we've been talking a lot about rain, but um, we also have, like we're having right now, we have drought. And um, if we can keep some storage on the landscape, that will help support those streams that have low flow during these periods. A lot of our streams right now are dry or, or close to dry, and that obviously affects habitat for the fish and bugs that are trying to live there. Um, our forest goal is to increase our forest management by about a little over 5,500 acres. And we want to increase forest stewardship plan by about 88 forest stewardship plans. And our target is going to be in areas that where those forests are helping to reduce peak flows and protect drinking water. Um, so there's a little graphic there just explaining what a forest stewardship plan is. And basically it's preparing a, a private or a professional forester with a private landowner. And it helps them determine what objectives they have for their forest land and make sure that they are able to get their um, objectives met and also protect water quality and, and looking at the bigger picture. Um, so, of course, we're talking about planning, but our goal is to actually have actions in that plan. Um, so they, they do things to help improve forest health, which will in turn help us reduce peak flows and protect our drinking water supplies. Um, so our outcomes with forestry um, is to, obviously, I just mentioned, protect drinking water and maintain that reduced peak flow because forests help us do both those things. Um, we also want to support our wood products industry. Um, and we obviously, it's in part of our economy. And we know that uh, there's a lot of species that require young forests to survive. So you know, logging is an important part, an important tool in, in maintaining forest health. Um, and by doing some of these projects, we'll also be improving forest habitat for a variety of species. For our farm goal, we want to increase lands enhanced by best management practices, but best management practices by about 4,400 acres. Um, and what does that what are what does that mean? Because I many people aren't familiar with best management practices. Well, that includes you know keeping livestock off streams. Um, improving feedlot runoff, improving soil health. 
Um, and these, all these things, we, we obviously, I mentioned that we have a really diverse uh, farm economy in uh, the watershed, and we, we really value that. So we want, want to do that. We want them to remain there and remain um, productive while also protecting our water quality. Um, so uh, the outcomes that we hope to achieve by this is to reduce phosphorus and sediment into our impaired streams in Lake Superior, um, protect our drinking water, increase storage. Um, just like I mentioned before, that storage is going to help um, with our streams and um, by, and we'll do this by improving soil health um, and preserve um, farming, preserve our farming community by increasing farm productivity while protecting water quality. Our groundwater goal, we are focusing on um, sealing unused wells. Um, the, the unused wells are, can be a direct uh, source of contamination to our drinking water supply. So obviously we want those sealed to protect that. Um, most residents in the watershed um, rely on private wells. So um, the first step though is we don't know where all these unsealed wells are. So we need to learn the location of those. And we plan to do that with um, outreach to our people living in the watershed. And once we find out where they are, we can um, seal those. Um, we also were very interested in pursuing um, a drinking water testing program for the watershed um, because there are some sensitive areas, um, sandier soils, which are more prone to having pollutants um, get into the drinking water supply. So we want to learn more about how that water supply is. And um, the other uh, additional thing is that we wanted to start discussions on a countywide point of sale septic inspection in Carleton County. Pine County, you are, you are doing this, um, and we don't do that in Carleton County yet. And, I, and we thought it would be worthwhile to discuss that and maybe lean a little bit on um, Pine County's experiences of how that could work. So, so and our outcome for the groundwater goal is to protect our drinking water supply. That's our, our main goal. There aren't many lakes in the watershed, but there are a few, and one of one one lake we share with Pine County. Um, and so our goal with our lakes is to um, enhance uh, those uh, priority lakes, which Net Lake is one of them, um, by reducing phosphorus by five percent and restoring five percent of parcels shoreline parcels. Um, so why do we care about phosphorus? Well, phosphorus in the lake, one pound of phosphorus equals 500 pounds of algae. Um, and algae in a lake makes it less fishable and swimmable. So we want to keep those lakes as nice as we can. Um, so our actions would include restoring shorelines, increasing stormwater practices, such as rain gardens. Um, and in some, in, we would also want to develop individual lake management plans um, to target the work. So if we know that the work we're doing is going to make a difference to those lakes. And that lake is one of those um, lakes that we want to have a lake management plan for. Um, our outcomes are to keep our lakes fishable and swimmable. Um, we also want to protect those. Um, Net Lake isn't listed as a DNR wild rice lake, but it is um, the 18 listed under the 1854 Treaty Authority. So there's a potential to have wild rice there. Um, also, we want to improve lake and visual aesthetics and increase and maintain our property values. Our you know our nice clear lakes are are going to be worth more than ones that are full of algae. Our final topic that we wrapped everything up in was our, our protection goal. And um, what I want to make sure everyone understands when we talk about protection is that it doesn't mean preservation. Um, we, we recognize our lands are working lands in, in this part of the, the county and we are in this part of the state. And we also recognize that that's an important way that we keep those, those resources healthy. Um, but we wanted to call out protection because um, we, we realized a lot of our, our topics had protection in the discussion. Um, so uh, first I'll just talk about where we want to do that. We're talking about sensitive areas for habitat, you know, our lakes we want to protect, water quality, some of these cold water springs that provide water to our trout species, um, some of our forests and drinking, and obviously we want to protect our drinking water supply. So there's a few different ways you can protect land. Um, our main action in our plan is to increase our um, the Sustainable Forest Incentives Act, which is a land covenant um, that private landowners can have that they agree they will not develop their land for a certain period of time. I believe it's eight to 50 years that they agree to, and then they get um, an incentive for doing that. Um, that's mostly where we are focused right now. Um, other things that you can do to protect land is you can um, have conservation easements. And um, where we see that being a, a tool that might be used is where if you're going to invest 
thousands of dollars into a uh, restoration project, it makes sense to permanently protect that that investment on the property. Um, finally, another um, the tool you use is land acquisitions. Um, that could be by uh, by you know public or yeah, public ownership. Um, but we don't anticipate doing any land acquisitions as part of this plan. Um, we add the, the advisor committee asked me to add um, a, a um, an action in the plan to talk about it. If there's places that we think it's it should be done, but we also realize that um, our tax rules are really important to our counties, and we don't necessarily want to take land um, out of uh, off those tax rolls. Um, so there's uh, action to look at it, but it, there's no action to acquire any land at this point. Um, our outcomes for protection is to protect our trout and other cold water species and our wild rice resource. Um, like I, <laughs> this keeps coming up, but we want to reduce peak flows and um, protect water quality in our lakes and streams, protect our drinking water supply and maintain um, habitat for sensitive species. Okay, now for the, the fun part, the money part. Um, if you go through the plan, you will see these this table and this color scheme in several places. Um, and uh, what, what it's describing is where different funding is gonna come from to fund this plan. So we have um, a baseline level, which is our current funding sources, the watershed-based implementation funding, which is um, what we hope to receive from the Board of Water and Soil Resources. And then our other funding sources include funding from our partners and competitive grants, our plan is a little bit different because we are doing a lot with that road stream interface. And so in our baseline funding, we are including county state aid dollars that are going to be used in the watershed, um, uh, township bridge funds, um, county road tax. Um, so that number is gonna look probably bigger than you may have maybe used to seeing. Um, and the other sources also include some federal money coming for road projects. So um, let's look at those numbers. As I said, they look kind of big because at least they look big to me because I'm not used to looking at um, my project numbers are usually a lot smaller. Than this. So um, for our baseline, we're looking about uh, $10 million over the next 10 years. And that, like I said, that's mostly coming for road projects. We all know how expensive those are. Um, we're hoping for just under $2 million from the um, watershed based implementation funds. Um, we'll see whether we get that or not. That's sort of up in the air, but that's what we're hoping to, re to receive. And then the other sources, those grants, partner funding, um, different cost shares, um, that's $15 million. So the total 10 year budget for the Nemaji watershed is about $28 million. That's a pretty big number in my mind. Um, as far as where that, those watershed based implementation funds are going, um, about a quarter is going into wetlands and stream work. Obviously, we're going to be spending a lot more money on streams, but a lot of that is coming from other sources. So it won't come from this watershed based implementation fund. We can't do very much with the money. We'll be, you know, most road projects are well over $200,000. So we realize that there's limitations on what we can spend there, uh, but there's still some work we can do. Um, a large portion um, right now out of our plan. Plan funds are going to go to agriculture, and there's um, a lot of gaps. And there are there are funds to get conservation in the ground, but we see a lot of gaps as far as technical assistance and um, engineering assistance. So we can, if we can get some more funds to do that work, we can get more conservation on the ground. So that's why that number is a little bit higher. There's really good funding sources available for forestry work through DNR cost share um, and the Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, and obviously lakes and um, protection and groundwater, those are important, but, um, you know, we have a little bit less expensive um, projects to do, a little less of a priority on those. Um, plan administration, we, after we get through this whole process and get the grant or get the plan approved on the board and soil resources, um, we plan to administer the grant funds that we will receive um, through a memorandum of agreement um, and that we will develop. Um, we can start developing after we get through the 60 day comment period. Um, but that, that is how we plan to administer these grant funds, which we thought would work well um, based on um, our good relationship with Pine County. So, right, like I mentioned earlier, we are at the eternal review process right now. We are going to be asking the um, uh, um, boards to uh, approve the 60-day notification of the draft plan in July. 
then we have that 60 days where um, stakeholders can give us their comments. Um, once we receive those, we will have a public hearing and um, who knows what that's going to look like in October. Um, maybe we'll be able to get together by then, maybe not. Um, our goal is to have the Regional um, Board of Water and Soil Resource um, review in December with the full board approval also in December. And then we hope to receive funds in um, early 2021 so that we can start getting projects on the ground next summer during construction season. So that's what I have. I know I went pretty fast, but I um, I don't know if you have questions now. Um, I'm, I'm always willing to take questions um, by email or phone and also um, uh, please feel free to provide any comments you have to the planning effort. Thank you very much. I do have a, a, a question and that's about the well ceiling. Do, yes. do you have a program that would um, help if a person had a well on their place that was discovered? Uh, I think sometimes there's a hesitancy to um, for some people to say anything because they know it's expensive. Right. And so um, do you have a plan to to help with that? Yeah, so there is there are, there is funding. Um, they would be eligible through the um, the Ag BMP loan program, which is a loan. Um, depending 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 on where the well is, if it's rural, um, Natural Resources Conservation Service helps seal wells as as well. Um, so it sort of depends. Um, right now, it's hard to know the scope of our the need for well sealing. Um, if we thought that there was a, a, a need for it, we could use watershed based and blood implementation funds for this. But right now we don't really know what that scope is. So it was hard to devote a lot of money to it. Um, our first goal will be to figure out where, if, how, what, what that number is. And then if we need to in the five year um, update for this plan, we could divert funds to do some of that work as well. I, I, I just know, you know, years ago they were trying to do a, a well abandoned well study in in our neighborhood and people were very reluctant to yeah. give up the location of a well because they were convinced in their mind that they were going to have it's going to cost them thousands of dollars to seal it if somebody found out about it right which which turned out to be the opposite of what they were really trying to get at is just find out how many wells there were so they knew what kind of budget to build. So it, it that's anyway. a, yeah, that's a good, good thing to know. It might be, uh, we might need to be somehow to make it anonymous so people can, uh, can right. tell us without having to tell us where it is. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, my <laughs> other question is the state, um, you know, the Magic State Forest, the, the state owns a lot of land. Have they been at the table uh, participating in this plan? Yeah, so they were um, at, so we, we had specific topic meetings um, through the process and DNR Forestry was um, at the forestry topic meeting. Um, I think they were at the streams and maybe wetlands topic meetings as well. I can't, it's, that was in the fall. So my memory isn't, I know for sure they were at the forestry, forestry meeting. Okay. So, okay. Um, they weren't on the advisory committee, but they were, they provide their input through that uh, specific meeting. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> Matt, Thanks, you got Melanie. anything to add? You're our, oh. you're our, um, <laughs> we'll pull the trigger on you. <laughs> thank you. I, I'm going to suggest we uh, take a short break for um, okay. 11.38 that we come back at 11.43. Uh, five minutes, guys, folks, and then we'll hear from uh, Terry. I'm in a short break.
Keep going here. Let's see. Is everybody back? <clears throat> How you doing, Terry? Good, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, I think we're ready for you. Sounds Terry, good. Terry Fawcett's going to give us update on the Regional Juvenile Center. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, Terry Fawcett, probation director here. Um, we had a June 4th uh, Juvenile Center Directors meeting. We didn't have the normal full board meeting. Um, I opted for a directors meeting to discuss. Uh, the main topic was uh, to discuss recruitment of non-member counties into the Joint Powers Agreement. The current Joint Powers expires at the end of 2021. Uh, counties specifically to be targeted for recruitment that are using consistent bed, uh, beds at... Uh, RJC are Benton County, Stearns, Freeborn, and Morrison. Um, member counties uh, strongly suggested that they need to develop new resources, such as more programming in RJC, instead of just being detention focused. Uh, their director, Todd Benjamin, will set up a subsequent sub ops group meeting to work on this. That group is largely agents and supervisors uh, that would have a better pulse on what specific programming would be beneficial for kids there. Um, during that meeting, I brought up a concern um, that COVID has had on the courts and specifically with Article 12 of the Joint Powers Agreement, which is an act of God clause. Um, subsequently, their director, um, Dylan Workington, uh, looked into the CARES Act funding and it does not apply to the Joint Powers. Um, and both him and, and Todd Benjamin indicated that uh, Anoka County or RG, nor RJC would be in a position to bail out counties from a bill at the end of the year. Um, so we'll get to that more in a minute. Um, all nine member counties were canvassed to see what kind of beds they were looking at in the new joint powers. Um, I just used our, our one bed, uh, for conversation for now. Um, one of the Pitt counties was not present there, but I, I do know what they're at least intending to do. So when you, when you added up what counties are looking to do in the next joint powers, it came up to 21. The current divisor is 24. So even if you recruited some of those new member counties, you still have to pick up three beds uh, from losing um, based on what, what members talked about at that meeting. So um, that's a concern. Uh, I also shared some concerns that we've had from, from Becky, the HHS director, um, and how the decreased revenues in HHS and furloughs of HHS staff impacts, um, you know, Pine County budget and um, uh, revenues and, and how that can be difficult. And when you get that, that balloon bill at the end of the year, if you're actually underutilizing your beds. Um, we also consulted with the county attorney, Reese Fredrickson, who took a look at the uh, joint powers agreement and that clause specifically, uh, he indicate that there is an argument um, about the act of God clause and would consider and consider pushing it. And that would be topic for conversation probably down the line or later in the year. Um, one of the things that, you know, RJC had, had indicated is their, their um, expenses are, are down as, too. They've, they've furloughed staff, laid off staff, 
and and haven't had as many kids in that facility. So, um, but we haven't really seen a, a, a deep dive into their books. Uh, subsequently, there was a an e meeting and motion on the table, and has been motion and seconded and approved, I believe, that the current non member rate of two hundred and sixty four dollars a day to go up to three hundred and twenty five dollars a day of first. And so, um, again, as part of the strategy to encourage those consistent users to become members instead of non-members, um, member rate currently is $264 a day. Um, some other topics of note, um, I, you, uh, Commissioner Hallen and David know, uh, Itasca County just lost their detention center. Um, and so now they're their closest place to, to bring a kid for detention will be Bemidji, 90 miles away. And so, you know, I think, and, um, and I'm sure Commissioner Ludwig will, will add some input here shortly, but there's a great value of having a juvenile center as close by as the one we have in, in uh, Line of Lakes in Anoka County. Um, you know, without it, we're looking at Bemidji or Duluth if there's a bed space and, um, you know, the overall county view of things, um, to lose that resource would be very difficult and would be very difficult on a sheriff's budget as well and sheriff's um, deputies' times. And so um, we, we all express our, you know, the value of the juvenile center, but also expressed our concerns. One of the things that they don't do is they're, the math and the current joint powers agreement is based on the RJC facility only. Myself and some others talked about in the new joint powers, wouldn't it be better to include the three different buildings on their campus to include in that? Because that has the non-secure programs uh, built into that. But in a subsequent uh, meeting I had with Dylan, those are all currently separate um, uh, line items and and can't be done and so that makes that that more difficult so we're really looking at our our numbers and our divisor based on that 365 days on contracting for that um, with limited um, options for what the programs offer currently um, so dylan uh, we he also is supposed to put together a memo and maybe taking a different look at at a you know separate cost center and just a different ways of looking at budgeting and so I'm gonna stay on them on that because it is something I wouldn't uh, mind having Kelly take a look at and, and Becky as well uh, as we as we look into the end of the year but um, one of the things that we had talked about before was having a, a committee of the whole meeting that got canceled due to COVID the question to the board and you know, and to David would be are we gonna possibly take a look at having that um, remotely. Um, and so, you know, the commissioners that maybe aren't as familiar with the joint powers agreement or with RJC can, can hear from them directly as well. So um, with that, I would uh, turn it over for questions or maybe comments from Commissioner Ludwig as well. Thank you. Matt, you got any comments? Well, my comments would be the, the the way the program was set up now, and I, I think I think our, I voted for a county to move with raising the fee for the non-members. But the way it was was it was just like twenty bucks difference. So why would you be a member and just buy as needed? So that's why there was a lot of counties that are using it, but they're not member counties. And we were getting by all these years because enough uh, enough juveniles were coming in and they were taking spaces for beds not utilized by other counties, so it would balance out. So so what's so it's probably good in some ways that a lot of juveniles aren't going there because you know we as Pine County ourselves have started programs where we don't want to do custodial things with juveniles and you know put a label on them right away. But we have to realize that I well, I say we try to keep a bed there because when we we will need beds for juveniles. And uh, the biggest problem like Terry spoke to is the windshield time. If we if we don't have a bed available, we'll be transporting juveniles to 
Timbuktu. So I don't know the um, best, you know, I don't know what, that's a, a close and easy one for us to access. And um, so I think it's the best for us now, but I don't, I don't know how this is all going to unravel because I think there's going to be counties that just say we're out of here, and, but we'll see. I don't know the outcome is what I was going to say. I've got a question, and I, I think primarily for Commissioner Ludwig, but Terry, you probably have a perspective as well. And in your presentation, Terry, you made the comment about Anoka not wanting to bail out the counties. And my question relates to what is the relationship of the Joint Powers Board with managing the finances of the facility? And we know that a lot of services have been disrupted. We know in some places there are cost savings, in some places there are increased expenses. Is, is that Joint Powers Board managing the operation as a way to provide high quality services at the lowest cost, or is, it, is Anoka structuring it so that it's kind of a, we're the only game in town, so take us, or you can drive to you know Bemidji or wherever else. I mean, what's the attitude in on the board for a cooperative solution that manages the budget long term versus a the, the numbers are what the numbers are? I'll start, Terry, if that's okay. So historically, I'll kind of we have our quarterly meetings down there, and at the end of the year, there's we always have reserves, capital, and. Uh, um, uh, the other one, I can't think of it. But anyway, so like last year, I couldn't make that meeting because I was at another meeting, but Terry was there. And they, we were just gonna take what the county owed for non-used beds out of our reserves that were sitting there. And it was gonna happen, and then, uh, I don't know, Terry could speak that some discussion started because someone didn't know what was going on. And the vote, well, I think it was ready, you know, there was a motion in a second, but then it was pulled off. And, and it ended up, they didn't use the reserves to pay off with the county, the other counties included. So there is a, the counties can drive that, or the, 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 board, the board can drive that. I don't know, what, I can't speak to that one, but I can speak to the mini before that. We, were, we had such a comfortable ratio that, yes, we need to have some reserves because it was camera changes, pre training, and all that stuff was coming at that facility. Um, so, I don't, Terry, can you speak to that last one? I mean, you don't have to throw anybody on the bus, but there was, was there was some confusion to me on that last vote at the end of the year to cover that budget. But typically we wouldn't, because we didn't have, nobody had a big bill, but this year the bills, because of lack of use, was different. So. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, yeah, I made the motion at that meeting and was seconded by Mille Lacs County and, um, it appeared that it was going to pass that we were going to take that from reserves and and it ultimately uh, didn't pass. But, um, you know, one of the to answer your question, David, I think the answer is in, in the middle um, because to kind of what Commissioner Ludwig said a few minutes ago, um, in my opinion, and I have some other directors opinions, RJC's um, not thinking ahead, they're being reactive, and that's right. not helpful. And because things have changed in this business, you know, I remember when I started, if a probation officer was mad at a kid on a Friday, he'd lock him up and then kid him out of RJC on Monday, and that's that's what you did. But that's not what you do with kids. That's not best practices, right. and that's certainly not what we do in Pine County with our Project Rise work. We try to use detention as little as possible and as i had in my uh, my annual report you know we even have a risk assessment that talks about whether or not a kid should go back to the juvenile center uh, after a first appearance and so everything is evidence-based and so less kids are spending um time there and even at, at our director's meeting here on june 4th todd benjamin said um more kids are coming in and they're just spending 24 hours there and they're leaving and he wanted to chalk that up all to COVID. And it's certainly 
somewhat COVID related, but it's not entirely. That That is how people do business with children these days is to get them out in their communities and do community programming. And so, um, and when the bigger counties and the joint powers uh, speak loudly, that causes concern. And, you know, uh, Wright County, um, uh, Washington, uh, Washington County, and Sherburne County, uh, but especially Washington, well, Washington and Oak and Wright all pay for beds that they don't need. Um, and, and Sherburne's going to drop a bed. And so, um, and some of their, their commissioners are asking more questions. You know, I, I think I said to Commissioner Ludwig recently, you know, if the if the year ended today, Mille Lacs County would write a check for one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars for unused beds. And so um, that that's a very difficult conversation to have with a with a county board on why we're writing these big checks when we're actually doing good correctional work and not placing kids in the facility. So. Um, and one thing I, I really encourage Todd to do, and this may be where the commissioners on the board um, could be more vocal or, or have a, a strategy is um, the next board meeting, full board meeting isn't until October. And it, it felt like Todd was going to just, you know, take our recommendations and then we wouldn't talk about it any further until October. And then all of a sudden the next meeting after that, um, the, the budget is in February. Well, to me, we should be all working long and hard between now and October to come up with some type of plan so we're not sitting here in February as counties going, gee, why are we writing this big check? Especially when counties are all suffering due to COVID. So I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. And if I can ask a, another question, I think the actual budget for this is housed in HHS. And I'm just wondering if Becky has any thoughts or a perspective. Thank you. Um, this is Becky Foss, Director of Health and Human Services. I do have some thoughts and perspectives on it. Um, this past year, we were over budget with out-of-home placements, which we've acknowledged and talked about. And even with being over budget with placements, HHS still got a bill in February for, I think, thirty-five dollars to $40,000 for unused beds from 2019. And so that was a hit um, to my budget. And then so far this year, we don't have a lot of kids in lockup. This is all a really good thing. Some of it's due to COVID. Some, some of it's just due to the really great work that's going on right now in Pine County. But as it stands today, I could get you know, nearly an $80,000 bill at the end of the year that comes out of the HHS department. And um, that would be that would be a tough pill to swallow. As everybody knows, we're doing furloughs, we're doing, um, we're leaving some positions vacant, we're suspending some contracts. So we're really trying hard to minimize expenses because we don't know what's going to happen. And then if we get this large bill at the, at the end of the year or beginning of next year, um, that's going to be just a real struggle. So I certainly understand that we don't want to um, harm the sheriff's office or their budget, but I guess I would ask people to really think long and hard about what it's doing um, to the HHS budget to if we do nothing. That's a good point. Okay. Th thanks for that perspective, Becky, because part, part of me says I was on that board for a long time and, and was convinced that it served a purpose to be part of that organization. So we had some place to go with kids because there was a time when that place, if you weren't a member, they might not have a seat or a bed for you. Right. So then, then where do you go? Um, Bemidji or Wilmer or wherever the next one was. Anyway, long ways away. And maybe the whole thing has changed. And it, part of it, in my mind, is like we built a jail that will hold 120 people if they're all the right kind of people. And I don't know if our jail population is 80 maybe now. We still own the jail. We got to have a jail, you know. And so um, is it a cost of doing business or has the business changed enough 
so we don't have to have that business model anymore. And the one or two outliers that that happen to us, we we know <clears throat> that's going to happen, so we budget for it, and it happens. I don't know. Or does the facility completely go away if everybody says uh, we can't afford to be a member anymore? You guys yeah. are—I I, I just think you guys are on top of it, and I'll let you keep giving us reports on where you think we should go. Mr. Yes. Chair? Yes. Oh, go ahead, Terry. Uh, I was just going to add, um, and I don't want to disclose the county publicly, but um, at this time, but um, as I indicated earlier, there is a, a county close by that uh, has, has indicated that they, they may pull out at the end of the year, got to give a year notice. And so, um, you know, depending on what the bad usage again looks like at the end of this year, it may be something to at least keep in the back of the mind about um, sharing a bed with that county. So you still have a foot in the door versus totally pulling out. But, you know, there has been and that last comment, Commissioner Hallen, that there has been counties that flat out told them that, listen, you know, 10 years ago, um, it would have been difficult to get a bed, but you can't tell us that now that, you know, it's, right. it's uh, we can roll the dice and probably still get in there, but, you know, now they're going to raise that non-member fee. But, but anyway, just thought, I thought I'd throw that out there. There might be, might be worth discussion later in the year if we're not making any progress with these other things to maybe take a look at partnering with another county so we're not totally out of it. That's a good point. Thank you. Did you have anything else to add, Matt? No, I was just going to bring that up. We could yeah. share with another county and cut, you know, say pay half a bed instead of a full bed. So, it... yeah. Well, that's why we have you guys go to those meetings, and um, if if we think we if if you think we need to have a committee of the whole meeting. Um, at some point, whether we do it online or however we do it, just to concentrate on this. It's a big item in Becky's budget. It's a big item for our kids, for the, what do you do with a kid if there's no place to put them and it's Friday afternoon? You, you stick a deputy in a car and send them to Bemidji um, and then go pick them up on Sunday night? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, Mr. Chair, the other thing with some are closing, some facilities are closing. Right. So maybe that maybe that's going to help. Maybe it's going to hurt. I don't know. You know, as far as um, members or people buying in, but well, that's yet to be determined. Okay. Thank you very much. And and be Terry, before we let you go. Uh, I just want to point out that Terry has testified at the legislature on behalf of all the probation people in the state and and especially for Pine County and he is going to testify again tomorrow and uh, we're happy to have him because I, I told him last night in an email that he was in my mind he was the, like putting Gump Worsley in as a goalie in the Stanley Cup um, Final. And if anybody doesn't know Gump Worsley, he was the leading um, goalie for the Montreal Canadiens and the New York Rangers and the Minnesota North Stars. Um, he had a long career from the 50s up into the early 70s, and he never wore a mask. Played goalie with no mask. And the, the story I remember about him, Terry, is one time in a Stanley Cup final game, it was down, I, it might even been overtime. There was a face off right in front of his net and he skates over to the referee and says, so how's your kid, how's your kid Nathan or whoever it is doing in college? I mean, he was a cool guy. He wasn't, you know, he just, uh, he played the game for the fun of it and and he cared more about what other people were doing with their lives than um, 
than whatever. So anyway, Terry, you're we're we're thinking of you, and you'll do a great job representing us. And hopefully, someday, the state legislatures will figure out that we we have a great delivery system, and they need to step up to the plate and fulfill their obligation that they made many years ago. Well, Commissioner. I'm not sure if I should take that as a compliment when you compared me to a goalie that didn't wear a mask, first of all. <laughs> but I'll t uh, but uh, I did talk to our lobbyists this morning. Um, what should, the way it would work is uh, if things go well tomorrow, it is the only thing on the agenda for tomorrow's hearing. Um, things go well tomorrow goes to ways and meaning, ways and means, and then to the floor on Friday. So hopefully by this weekend we'll will be funded and uh, we'll all have a good weekend. So we'll see what happens, but and I'll, I'll try to remember to turn my camera on tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. And it, and it is a compliment because I, in my opinion, Gump Worsley was one of the coolest guys ever to play the game. So not because he didn't wear a mask, just because he, <laughs> he was a cool guy. And Mr. Chair, if we can suffer one more comment on this topic, when Terry was testifying last time, the committee ended with uh, some members with the sentiment that, well, this would be super nice, but too bad we have a budget deficit, so we're not going to do anything with it. And I paraphrase, uh, but that was kind of the sentiment that it ended with. So for it to be back in special session, talking about funding, additional funding, which would be new money, is remarkable uh, and so it's certainly the probation officers as an organization have figured out how to marshal the right uh, forces at the right time to keep this uh, issue alive yes so thank you uh let's move on to a coronavirus update Sam, still on? I'm here. Can you hear? Okay. I also double muted myself there for a second. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sam Lowe, Director of Public Health. Um, just to kind of give an overview of just where we're at um, globally, nationwide, down to Pine. Um, we're at 8 million cases globally. So that number continues to tick about 130 new, 30,000 new cases a day kind of hovered around there for a while now. So that's still a lot of cases per day. Um, in the US, we're at 2.1 million with 118,000 deaths. Models are currently predicting that we'll have about 200,000 deaths by October. And that doesn't include a second, third wave come this fall. So who knows? Um, we are seeing there are about 22 states right now that are seeing a pretty noticeable increase in cases beyond what just a normal steady influx would be. That's generally down in the south, in the Sun Belt area, um, some in the west like California. Um, and it's generally the states that were very quick to reopen. In early May, they were just gung-ho to reopen things. Um, and that's where we're seeing these really substantial increases in cases. States that were more cautious to open and are just now starting to reopen in June or very late May um, have seen a different trajectory. So we are actually in that group, which is really good. Um, and we're having a much slower increase and we're actually seeing a drop right now in Minnesota in terms of number of cases per day. Um, and it looks like it's kind of a combination of when did states reopen, how good are they at actually listening to the rules and rules being social distancing, working from home, wearing masks. Um, and if they're good about that, they tend to have these better lower case numbers. So right now in Minnesota, we're sitting at a total of 30,882 cases to date with 1,300 deaths. Um, over the past week or so, we've been hovering around 300 cases a day which is a significant improvement over, oh, three weeks ago when we were around 800 cases a day. So it's actually where nobody knows exactly what's gonna happen. So it's kind of a pleasant surprise at the moment. Um, COVID hospitalizations are down, which is also good. 
um, but use for non-COVID related, ICU use for non-COVID related is up because we're mm -hmm. allowing these elective procedures to happen again. So we really have about the same number of hospital beds available, but we can get these get people back in who have been waiting for a couple months. So that's actually a good thing too. Um, and we've started to get testing numbers back from people who were tested because they were at either the vigils or the mass um, gatherings down in the cities or anywhere. Um, and it has a, those people have had a very low positivity rate, which is a really good sign because it means that most people were wearing masks, um, which video evidence kind of suggests um, was true because of they were wearing masks and actually trying to at least keep some distance at times, um, very few people are catching it from attending the, the gatherings. So that's really exciting. Uh, Pine County currently has 96 cases, uh, or total of 96 cases. We don't currently have 96. Um, and none of our recent cases have been in the prison. So they've just been kind of trickling in as we get them scattered around the county. Um, we are doing all of our case investigation and contact tracing for them. So if they're not at the prison, we are the ones calling them and saying, hey, you need to stay home for this long. Where did you go? Who did you meet? Let me, and then we contact them. Um, unless it's, you know, like they were around their husband. We assume they can, you know, talk to their husbands. Um, but other than that, we've been working with long-term care facilities to make sure they're getting connected to tests as they need it. Um, the state's also doing some put and prevalent studies around where they'll go in and test an entire facility at, within a couple hours. Um, so that's kind of being coordinated. And right now we're kind of in a lull and it's kind of exciting. It's kind of nice. I'm enjoying it while it lasts because I don't know if it's going to last. Um, I do think Minnesota in general is doing a really good job of listening to the rules, trying to wear masks when possible, um, when you're out and about, working from home still when you can. Um, so it's it's positive and I, we just don't want people to let up because that's why we're doing so well is because people are actually following through on these guidance. Um, and the last thing is that there might be a seasonal component, but we don't know. So we will likely see an uptick in the fall, but since we don't know much about this disease at this point, we might not. And we can just all cross our fingers. But so we're not sure, but we're doing good. So keep up the good work of wearing masks, staying home as needed, working from home, doing good. Thank you. Any questions of Sam? Yeah, Mr. Chip. Yeah. Terry, I have an update as well. Yep. Um, effective July 1st, uh, probation will open, um, open up to the public um, to come to the window uh, any, any questions, but it will pay their, their local corrections fees. Um, and then our case, our administrative assistant um, will go back to um, you know, five days a week in the office. I think our my case A is going to take still take some decent amount of vacation this winter or this summer anyway. So, uh, but that will that will help uh, the auditor recorders area there from getting questions, and it will you know ensure that our clients that don't have the ability to pay fees online can pay at the window. We'll mask up, and nobody will come back into our spaces. Um, I did check with Judge Martin last week, and uh, it's you know, basically my agents won't be needed in the building anytime soon or for the foreseeable future. The DOC agents are um, a little bit now, but their next big, big uh, test will be the, the criminal jury trials. And so um, it'll be uh, business as usual in terms of remote hearings for county probation officers. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? So I can update on the CARES Act. Yep. 
So in March, Congress approved approximately $2 billion in coronavirus relief funding for the state of Minnesota. That was part of the CARES Act. And the federal government made direct appropriations to states and cities and counties of 500 people or more. So in Minnesota, that was only Hennepin and Ramsey County that have received the money. Uh, cities and counties below 500,000 must rely on their state to provide the funding. Senate file 47 is the bill under consideration at the special session. Uh, this bill makes a direct appropriation to every county and each city and township of 200 people or more. The total appropriation to local government is approximately $841 million. The legislation provides funding on a per capita basis. It's approximately $25 per capita for townships, $75 per capita for cities, and $121 per capita for counties. And counties also receive uh, an amount for cities and townships below 200 people. Uh, the eligible usage is outlined by the federal government, and generally there are uh, the expenditure must be necessary due to the public health emergency due to COVID-19. The uh, expenditures were not accounted for in the most recent agency budget, and the expenses were incurred from March 30, excuse me, March 1st to December 30th, 2020. So a very narrow window of time. And then the eligible, or excuse me, uh, generally the money can be used for things such as plexiglass, technology to support telework, PPE, sanitizer, et cetera. At least 10% of the funds must be used for emergency financial assistance to individuals and families and for economic support to business. Uh, all city funds must be expended by November 15th and county funds by December 15th. Uh, and then on spent city funds roll to the county and on spent county funds uh, roll back to the state. And anything not spent by the state by December 30th goes back to the federal government. Uh, the legislation is not approved yet. And so once it is approved, we'll need to move quickly to ensure we maximize the impact of funds on economic recovery to businesses in Pine County. Uh, because of the significant amount of money, commissioners may want to assign a committee of jurisdictions to provide policy guidance and oversight. Uh, because much of the funding is targeted at economic recovery, uh, the Economic Development Committee might be a good choice, and that's commissioners Mikrot and Moore. Uh, and then I've been in contact with the city administrators for Hinkley, Sandstone, and Pine City, and all of them have indicated they would like to consider a collaborative approach uh, to the community funding. So, assuming that that SF-47 gets approved, uh, it should allow about $3.6 million uh, to flow to Pine County that we can use uh, for community recovery and then also for our direct expenses. David, it, I'm confused on that money. Does, does 3.6 million come to us and then we write checks to the cities and townships or do they get a direct appropriation? If, if they're over 200 population or 200 or over, they get the money directly. So okay. we do so have the, the 3.6 million or whatever we get we can use for improvements we've made to operate at this point. And then 10% of that 3.6 million has to be used for, uh, to help businesses out of an economic bind, correct? Yes, yes. And in that, in that 3.6 million is a very small amount that accounts for the jurisdictions under 200. And I don't have yeah. that total, but it's, it's it's not a significant amount of the three point six right. million. The, so three hundred and sixty thousand bucks we have to divide out to businesses. And and I would I would ask Josh and John if they would if they would take that on as a committee, but before you get too far down the road, once everybody understands what it is, maybe we should have a committee of the whole meeting. So that, because I think we'll get a lot of questions from businesses mm -hmm. and it would be 
I would like to know. So, so I got some answers. So I, I think we start out at the committee level and then bring that back to a com to the committee of the whole and then give it back to the committee. Does that make sense? Yes. And if we wanted, is it easier to put something on the calendar when we're all here? Assuming that, I mean, if it's, it's got to be approved quickly, right? All the, all the smart money is saying it will get approved this week. Uh, we've got a phone call on Friday with the uh, county administrators and, and I would invite Josh and John to join that at 10 o'clock. Uh, and there may be some city council members on the call as well. We could schedule something next week, I guess would be my point if that's easier for a committee of the whole. Yeah, I think, that, will we know enough? I, I mean, I was thinking maybe the committee could meet next week and then we could come back with the committee, because we'll meet again on, uh, we won't meet until again. July 7th. 7th. Monday so, the 29th is wide open if they want to come back by then and the committee meets next week. Or, or the 30th, uh, or the 30th. Yeah. Well, 30th is something. Well, that's tech, tech yeah. technology tech. meeting. So yeah, the 29th or 30th, 29th would work fine for me. Just, I, I mean, I think the committee needs a little bit of time to get their feet wet before we get the whole group there. Would uh, tentatively then the 29th does like nine o'clock in the morning work? Yep. Yep. And then the um, state of Minnesota, in order to access these funds, each jurisdiction has to certify that they will use the funds as allowed by law. And that certification has not been written but we can submit it as early as the 22nd. And so I would, I'm just wondering if the commissioners would want to delegate to me, the administrator, the authority to submit that certification on the 22nd. I'll move that. <laughs> Matt, Matt moves it. Do we have a second? Was that? was that maybe Commissioner uh, Chafee on the phone? Commissioner Moore. Oh, it sounded like Commissioner Moore. Uh, I think it was Josh, but his his thing is going around and around and around. But I saw his lips moving, and I, <laughs> I think I heard enough that he said he would second it. But he's frozen in time. And I, I saw something flash up that Chafee left the call. And I don't see him on there anymore. You, so we're, we have three commissioners active right now. Would four. another commissioner want to second it? And you I, still have will, four of you. Is John Mickrit still there? I'm not. Yep, I'll second him. Okay, there we go. So, we got a motion made and seconded. Uh, any discussion? The clerk will call the roll, knowing that we probably got lost two people. Roxanne. I think we're doing can we do an audible on this with two here. I'm I'm not hearing Roxanne. Okay, so. can you hear me now? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh District Four, Commissioner Mickrod. Aye. District five, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District one, Chair Hallen. Yes. Um 
District 2, Commissioner Moore. Are you back with us, Josh? I see him. Feels like he's hearing us, but I'm not hearing. It must not be. Okay. Um, so, so District Two. Oh no. No, he froze up again. Okay. And District Three, Commissioner Chafee. Hi. He's back. Okay. Yeah. An eye from Chafee. Okay. That because there was a little confusion on that vote, Mr. Chair, if I could just recap, it was four to zero with Commissioner Moore unavailable. Yes, that is correct. Okay. You, David, maybe you can follow up with Josh and John to make sure they're on board with a committee meeting next week. We'll do. Okay. Any other coronavirus updates? We'll move on to some commissioner updates. Uh, I've been on the AMC Blue Ribbon Committee. Um, that committee is working hard with the getting getting um, talking to legislators about the waivers especially for health and human services and for probation funding but the the health and human services waivers uh, the the number one priority I guess right now is to make sure that once the emergency order expires that we have an extension so we just don't have to go from one afternoon working the way we have been for the last three months to the next day working the way we did prior to this um, because we're still across the state majority uh, working from home and so the to comply with the way we did business six months ago would be very, very difficult. I, there doesn't seem to be a huge outpouring of people saying these waivers are the stupidest thing we ever did. We should, never should have done them. It's kind of the opposite, but it's like pulling teeth to get them to react to the fact that these really work and let's put them in place either at least for 60 days or, or permanently. I mean, some of them seem, in my mind, they're just no brainers, but um, we'll keep working with people. Uh, David, are we still on to meet with um, Representative Nelson tomorrow morning at nine? Yes, we are. Okay. So we will keep working on that. Um, Arrowhead County Association. John, did you get to that? Uh, yes, I believe I reported that oh, the okay. last meeting okay. already. That's what, that's what I thought. <clears throat> Council on Aging. Uh, I think I reported on that last time. Central Minnesota EMS. Yes, I went Ludwig uh, June 5th. Um, the highlight probably is is the uh, they ordered we you know I think I had I had reported last time that they ordered uh, those sterilized gun sprayers for the ambulance and our squad cars and when and when they come to a jurisdiction everybody gets to use them well they're all back ordered because of the but there's 21 she calls it Operation Super Soaker over there but anyway there's 21 ordered and we're supposed to get them and when they come you know. Um, the other highlight is they're out of naloxone. Um, we we did fund an order, so there's we ordered 200 doses, so they they should be coming. Hoping they be here this week. So you've heard anything, Jeff? Okay, yeah. So anyway, we'll see. We need those, and we're working on a new grant. Um, well, more update on that later. I don't know what's happening with that yet. So, but that was pretty much it. waste 
garbage keeps coming in um, and a lot of it uh, because people seem to be spending a lot of time working on projects and part of those projects include cleaning the garage and the shed and the spare bedroom or whatever. So um, one thing that has changed, I don't know if I reported, we, we had hired a trucking firm that pulled the trailers from the transfer stations to the uh, landfill for the last several years. It has become very problematic uh, not having, sometimes their drivers wouldn't show up. They'd decide on their own to go home. And so we terminated that contract, uh, bought our own tractor and have some, we're hiring another driver. We got another truck on order so we can be in control of our own destiny. Um, with any new startup business, there have been a couple of hiccups, but uh, nothing substantial. The other thing we're going to do is we can't get anybody to haul our leachate. And so we have bought our own trailer. And so we will be hauling leachate um, uh, whenever we have drivers available. It's a constant battle. And that it's not raining this spring has really help because there's a little less water going into the landfill, which means there's less leachate coming out. So anyway, that's kind of what's going on there. Library board. Yeah. You got me back. Yep. I got you, Josh. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. I, I must have died. Anyways, uh, I did miss some meeting. But uh, some highlights, I think, I can't remember, they're, they're moving into the new uh, headquarters. Um, I did email the director this morning to get a few more highlights, but I haven't got it back yet. But uh, um, I, I think they had an on-site meeting at the new headquarters in Cambridge, so they're move, moving in. Uh, it was a little slowed up because they couldn't get some of the furniture. Um, and then I'm trying to get a tentative date on when the libraries are going to open up. Um, for in person again, but it uh, should be, I think they're talking fairly soon. So hopefully operations can start getting back there. Um, I know I've received a few phone calls wondering when they're going to open, um, but we'll see. So thanks. Thanks, Josh. Um, 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 um. Chemical Health Coalition. Yes, I attended that one. Um, we're still working on getting our one-on-one uh, -on -one compensation interview surveys completed. Uh, need to be done at the end of this month, hopefully. Um, going pretty well, but just want to get a few more. On to tobacco, um, we're looking at doing, getting this uh, compliance checks done this year sometime. They should be done once per year. Um, have a P and I grant that funds the alcohol compliance check, but will not fund tobacco. Um, so we're hoping maybe the co coalition will fund that somehow. So we're working with the sheriff department to see how that can be funded. It's approximately five hundred dollars um, per time per check. Trainings for this year: the Montana Institute training was moved out to September this year. And other than that, Becky. Foss um, informed us that the legislature passed um, setting some funds aside for the opiate epidemic use. Uh, money can be used for prevention and interventions. Um, that's what we know this time but to come up that one, but it's something that we can use, I'm sure. So that's about it for that one. Well, water, Matt. Yep, we met June tenth. Uh, pretty, pretty much just a normal meeting. Um, highlight is the that I, I think I have. I said this a couple of meetings, but the, the forestry um, and uh, um, the management plans and the stuff he's doing with the sustainable stuff. 
he's doing a great job and they get there's a lot of acreage coming in for them and keeping them quite busy he's actually a little bit behind right now and i think with some of the COVID stuff too but that's a good strong program that's happening there um and um, there was some federal people there too this meeting from the ncrs and um, gave reports and i did ask about the soil survey and we had some discussion about that. It's 30% complete in Pine County. And uh, they advise that they're now using the LIDAR, LIDAR, so it's uh, much more accurate and they get a lot more work done from the office and they can do less on site um, digging and verification of soil types, but they're still doing those. And I, and I just learned today that they have um, had outreached our county to store some equipment here through Caleb, so they are working on that. Oh, and then I should add, I did, I did speak with Jill at the um, before the meeting started. I told her that we were having some discussion uh, about um, maybe taking the water plant back into the county. So, and I told her we'd reach out to her more on that if we have a meeting, so we can meet with them. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Law library. Um, I did miss that one as well. So, uh, and I would refer it to Reese, but I do believe he missed it too. So I think we got it one rescheduled here pretty quick. So. Well, I was waiting for Reese's report. Oh, got it. Um, everybody missed is the report. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> Uh, jobs and training. The jobs and training meeting was exactly at the same time as the Blue Ribbon Committee, and they were both very, very interesting. But it was very, very interesting because I had one of them on my iPad and one of them on my laptop, and I was trying to toggle back and forth, and so I probably didn't um, do a good job, but I um, I, I do know that the workforce, um, unemployment numbers, of course, it's not surprising have gone about triple from what they were in, uh, January, February. Um, there is some predictions that that will change as things start to open up rather quickly. Um, but it's interesting in the businesses I, I've talked to that um, they're, they're a little reluctant to call all their help back full time because, and they, nobody wants to come and work part time because they're making such good money on unemployment, then they don't want to screw that up. So um, it's kind of a catch 22. So I don't know how long that unemployment is going to continue but um it's it's kind of a crazy crazy thing that's going on people that are working i i've talked to many many people who have small businesses that are in the contracting world are so darn busy they cannot see straight and they've had a, a stretch of weather that they can't hardly imagine how long it's been since they're almost hoping for a rain day so they can get rested up and and fix on stuff. But um, it's been a, a credible run for a couple of months for them. And I I do know this when you go to the the lumber yard or the hardware store, there are just some materials you cannot get. Um, they they're out of them and. We've relied a lot on one thing is screws for screwing together a deck or something. And apparently the containers that full of screws that we used to get from China are not coming. And the US suppliers can't make screws as fast as people are using them. So um, that's what I've found out anyway. Board of Equalization. Went good. <laughs> I, I think I think Lori did an outstanding job and having things prepared and her staff uh, 
we should make sure they get a big thank you for um, the people that were there, I believe um, uh, it's tough for the one guy that, um, well, he was kind of mad at the world anyway. Um, he wasn't mad at the staff as much as he was just mad. But the, the rest of the people thought the staff did a, a outstanding job of coming back and double checking their work and making sure that, you know, they didn't agree with what the staff did, but they, they didn't say the staff was a bunch of lazy bums. They, they complimented them on their work. So I, that makes me feel good. Mr. Chair? Yes. I do have an other when you get there. Yeah, so. go ahead. I'm there. Okay. So we, we uh, the public safety committee yep. with a AMC, we had an emergency meeting Monday. Okay. It was like two days notice, but there was, we went over 19 proposals for law enforcement. <laughs> anyway, we went over the two hour AMC limit on the meeting also, but it was a really good um, outspoken meeting and we um, put enough of it, enough information together so they could take it to the uh, executive committee there and bring it to the legislative body. So it was, uh, it was worth, it was worth the time. Thank you. Thanks for yep. being on that committee too, by the way. Yeah. I, I got an email. I think this morning I reported that I'd got an email that there are 10 fairs that in the state of Minnesota that have not canceled. I just got another email that it's now down to eight. So if you're going to go have fair food, the closest place I know is Rock Creek. The Mangles have several of their food stands set up there. So you can go have uh, horn dogs and um, french fries and cheese curds and I'm not sure what else is there, but uh, any other business we need? Mark, I, I, I do have to ask you for a road update, uh, how, how things, how the projects are going. Are you prepared to give us a little? Uh, we've got uh, 67, pretty well wrapped up. Just doing the cleanup and seeding and that here this week, using gravel. Now they're starting up on 52, and our crews are doing some work on having part 52. We're getting ready to pave that. The bridge on 52 is open, so um, that was kind of the carryover work. We've got bids out to do three box culver projects. One's on 27 by Grindstone Lake. One is east of Sandstone on 30, and one is... Uh, up on 150, I guess you'd call that kind of the Finlayson area. So those are coming out. Uh, we've got our paving bids will be coming out in a few weeks here. Uh, we've kind of got Main Street and Pine City scheduled for mid-August. Um, Want to get that all wrapped up before if school starts. Um, and there's a paving set down here in 107, 108, 70. And Main Street 61 and Pine City and then up north we've got uh, all those on 52 and 157 and then there's a couple city streets for Sturgeon Lake that we are helping them out with so those are kind of our projects for this year looks like the sales tax isn't really but actually we had more sales tax from if you compare the month from last year I think for April March was a little down, but I don't think we're going to see any major hiccups on the sales tax collection. So that's that's some positive news. So anyway, thanks, Mark. And and I do need to. I got to talk offline I got a question for you too so I'll give you a jingle when the meeting's over um anything else we need to work on if not keep up the good work stay safe stay cool 
one of these days I might get caught up on all those projects around the house. I, but I think Pinterest keeps pushing that stuff out the door. So somebody I'm married to keeps finding them. We should do this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway. We'll declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you all.